Uh, nutrition exercise experience with Pompeii disease. Uh, first, welcome to our presentation. We're glad that you're here. Um, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a physical therapist or a dietitian. I'm living with Pompeii disease, trying to manage the daily disease as best as I can. Preserving the physical capabilities I have remaining is extremely important to me. Many things with our disease are out of my control, but nutrition and exercise are things that I can control. I attend every webinar and seminar that I can regarding nutrition and exercise in Pompeii disease. The following is some of what I've learned along the way. A recap for Pompeii. Pompeii disease is a rare metabolic disorder where there is an enzyme, a chemical, in the body that's supposed to break down stored energy into usable energy within a specific part of each cell. In Pompeii, that enzyme doesn't fully do its job. So that stored energy called glycogen accumulates in a specific part of the cell, the lysosome, eventually causing issues within the cell. The cells that most commonly store and use this type of energy are proximal muscles, meaning the ones closest to the body. They're typically the most impacted, even though Pompeii itself is not a muscle disease. There are some alternate names for Pompeii, including acid maltase deficiency and glycogen storage disease type two. Umbrella classifications would be glycogen storage disease, lysosomal storage disease, and a rare disease. Adjacent communities would be neuromuscular disorders and muscular dystrophy. Studies have shown that nutrition and exercise are important in the management of metabolic disorders. Um, it's not advancing. There we go. Pompey started talking early. I showed some mild symptoms as a child, such as poor posture, gait abnormality, soft speech, and trouble gaining and maintaining weight. Despite these indicators, I had a pretty normal childhood and was constantly active. When we were young, we rode our bikes, climbed trees, and played outside until the street lights came on. I played football with my older brother, rode dirt bikes, ran track, and played basketball in high school. As a child growing up in a household with four older siblings and two parents, dinner time was quite busy. Special dinners weren't prepared, and we pretty much ate whatever was served. There wasn't much thought given to protein or carb content, and we didn't get much fresh fish living in the Midwest although we wouldn't have known to consider that anyway. And life continued. When I started hearing Pompeii in my body, the progression of my symptoms was slow and steady over the years with my symptoms reaching a real clarity after the birth of my second son in 2003. I was 41 years old at that time and during my pregnancy had increased weakness, trouble getting up from a chair, gait abnormality, hip and ankle pain, and poor posture, all of which I attributed to giving birth at a later age. By 2010, these symptoms remained and I finally sought a diagnosis. I saw doctor after doctor in search of an answer and eventually they incorrectly diagnosed muscular dystrophy. Looking back, I remember as a 14 year old going to my mom, feeling like something was, wasn't quite right with my body, but she dismissed it telling me different people have different body types. This was after going to see a doctor at four to five years old for gait abnormality. And the doctor's diagnosing me with a case of her hips and legs are growing faster than the rest of her body. I remained untreated and became much weaker. I started walking with a cane due to frequent falls and my balance was unstable. I used a manual wheelchair most of the time when leaving my home. I was depressed and my general health was headed downhill. In October, 2015, during a routine follow-up at the local MDA clinic, the doctor I was supposed to see called out sick and the replacement wasn't so sure it was an MD. In November, 2015, I received my correct diagnosis of Pompeii. And we're gonna turn this over to Ryan. Yeah, he just has to remember to turn the mute off. Um, where, I don't know where it is. Okay, Sean. Has to no, I, okay. I did it. It's, it's, I'm making fun of myself here. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, so, so as Vanessa's already shared, um, you know, 
I've had I, her experiences of, of, of hearing symptoms um, once she knew to listen for them, um, perhaps her whole life. Um, I had a very similar experience from, from at least early childhood, um, but potentially um, as early as, as within a couple of hours of birth uh, that Pompey was talking, but we didn't hear it. Um, you know, we've gotten fast forward to the point now where, where there's many things, I, I wanna just highlight something that, that, there, that she said, that there's many things with Pompeii and, and also in life that are out, out of our control, but, but the nutrition and exercise elements are things that are in our control. So um, the opportunity to hear Pompeii once you, once you know what's going on is really actually a, a cool thing um, because it means you can start to do something. Um, if we click ahead, Vanessa. Oh, sorry, Brad. <laughs> I, I, I changed it last minute on her to add some animation <laughs> to, to help me pace myself. So uh, she has to actually pay attention now. <laughs> um, so um, when we talk about how early our symptoms started, um, it's not really to, uh, the point of it is not to scare anyone that this progression is, a, is a, this looming cloud that's going to like immediately turn on uh, one day. Um, it's really to, let's go to the next one. Um, it, the, the, the takeaway we're going for is really more like, in our cases, we went 30 and 40 years between when symptoms actually started and when they got bad enough for diagnosis to happen um, and, and if we were able to get on treatment. And, and along that way, we'd already, um, you know, sort of had, had meaningful progression over that period of time. Um, you know, but we were, we were blindly on this journey with no ability to steer it because we didn't know what was going on and we didn't even realize that we were on the ride. Um, you know, in our childhood and, and, and maybe later than that, we, we, we played outside, we broke bones, we fell out of trees, we played sports, we scraped our knees, we did all the things um, you know, the, the, the things that you, that you do growing up. Um, and we've had happiness and sadness and fulfilling careers and loving families, et cetera. And that was all before we knew, knew, knew what Pompeii was. Um, but that whole time Pompeii knew us. Um, so for the folks that, that are newly diagnosed um, or, or through newborn screening diagnosed and, and kind of wondering what to look forward to, um, you know, obviously each person's a little bit different on the spectrum uh, of, how, of how the disease impacts them. But, um, you know, here's at least a couple of examples in our experience where uh, it was talking for a long time uh, and, and we, we now have something that we can do about it. So uh, the main takeaway, again, is that, that uh, along this journey, um, the most important part uh, uh, is now unlocked for everybody that's here, um, which is awareness of the disease and an interest in getting educated about it. Um, you know, you've, you know, you've had your diagnosis and you showed up tonight because to, you want to learn something about it. Um, so the empowerment that comes from that provides an incredible opportunity to manage the rest of your journey. Um, so I wouldn't be me if I, I didn't like get super nerdy at some point in talking about Pompeii. Um, so I wanted to, to take a little step back and, um, and, and share some things. So like we start out at birth and we are two cells, um, you know, one from one, one, one sperm cell and one, one, uh, uh, egg cell from, from our parents. Um, and then by the time we're adult, we're adults, we're some hundred trillion ish cells that, that, uh, our body is made up of, um, within those cells, um, you know, as, as we're growing and, 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 and our cells are multiplying and doing all that kind of thing, they're starting to differentiate. So within an adult, there's, there's 200 or so different types of cells. Um, and, and where, where all of this relates to Pompeii is, um, glucose is a primary energy source for those cells. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll touch base on, on glucose in a second. Um, so taking even a step further then, um, because we were all worried about how Pompeii affects our muscles, um, we can think of our muscles, especially the large ones, as having hundreds of thousands of, of these cells or muscle fibers um, within each muscle group. So like if you have a bicep, that your bicep is not literally one thing. It's, it's actually hundreds of thousands of these, of these cells. And each one of those cells has, uh, has around a thousand lysosomes in it. So we know with Pompeii that, that from, from the, um, uh, the intro that Vanessa gave that Pompeii is specifically um, glycogen, which is the store, stored form of glucose building up and accumulating in the lysosomes. And the lysosomes are kind of like the closets within our cells. That's where we stuff all the stuff, all the things until we, until we're ready to use it. Um, so there, there's really um, a lot of storage space. And, and this is really to, to kind of 
help understand on a bio uh, on a biological level what's happening when when the disease when we say progression of the disease progression is that those closets are getting full those thousand plus lysosomes are getting full in one cell and then they're getting full in other cells as well eventually um, expanding into other it, it, to, to meaningful parts of the muscle um, so what this kind of looks like uh, in, a, in a microscope is uh, on the top there, we have a healthy human muscle fiber. Um, and you can see it's just kind of like very orderly, um, you know, there, there's a lot of clear structure to it. Um, and then the bottom is a, is a more sort of more severely affected uh, Pompeii muscle fiber. Um, so this is what, what happens uh, under microscope to, to each of those individual uh, fibers or cells that uh, when, when the closets get too full and they, 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 they rupture and, and overflow and like leak material into the cell. So it causes it to be unhealthy overall. Um, but I think the really interesting thing for this is uh, if we click the next button, is that both of these are from the same, for the same biopsy. They're from the same person, from the same muscle, uh, from, from somebody who has Pompeii. Um, and I think that this is a really important thing uh, to, to, to realize is that um, even if we are getting to the point where we starting, we're starting to feel meaningful progression, um, there's still, there are still are healthy fibers in there. So the idea uh, framing tonight's discussion is the idea that appropriate exercise will work to maintain those healthy ones that, that we see on the top, um, while proper nutrition um, can potentially work to slow down the progression that we see shown in the bottom one. So jumping in more to the muscles, because that's the kind of where we, where we experience our Pompeii the most uh, in an outward way, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to, to reiterate from what we just learned there is that um, Pompeii does not directly prevent muscles from working or developing um, as, as, a, as a group. Um, there's a, the, the protein that we're talking about, that, that chemical, that enzyme that, that, uh, that we talked about earlier, GAA, um, is not responsible for anything to do specifically with the muscles. It's responsible for, for breaking down the stored form of energy into a useful energy. There are other enzymes that our bodies that are, that are genetics code for to create, to build muscle or break down muscle. Um, and when there's uh, variations in those kinds of things or diseases that, that, that are genetic diseases that are associated with that, that typically falls under the category of, of a muscular dystrophy. Um, so Pompeii is not a muscular dystrophy. It is, uh, but, but the, the, the effect on the muscles is downstream. So really what's up with the muscles uh, is, uh, is what the, I guess the question comes back to because why we always talk about muscles. Um, and the reason we talk about them is that muscles are, are big users of glucose as an energy source. So um, you, can, you can imagine if they're the biggest users, they're also going to store the most. And when they're storing that glycogen and it's not breaking down to provide the energy over time, it can lead to issues within the cells. So if we look at this, uh, this, this cartoon um, in the background there, um, this is uh, 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 the human musculature um, with kind of a breakdown of what muscles are, are typically reported as being involved in Pompeii. And it makes sense. The ones that are the, that, that the majority of patients experience some notable weakness in are the big muscles, the ones that are responsible. You know, your shoulder has to move your whole arm, um, your, your, your hips, your glutes, your core have to move your whole legs, your walking, your stability. So um, it really makes sense when we think about uh, where our movement, where, where, where all that's coming from um, and the energy to supply those muscles for their function, um, you know, why we're, why we're seeing those muscles start to be the, the, the more notable ones. Um, so in, in detail, um, one of the hypotheses um, that seems to be true um, so far as I can tell, uh, but it's really a more recent one, uh, is that if you reduce the available energy to those cells, that can cause problems. So they don't develop as much, um, but, but we know that there's also other ways to, to energize cells. Um, the body's really robust that way. Um, the, the second um, hypothesis is about, you know, what is happening. This is all again, downstream in the metabolic process within the cells, uh, is that if the glycogen is not getting broken down or broken down fully and then used, it can build up and accumulate. 
And we know that that is true. We can see that in, in, in microscopy. Um, we can see the, the glycogen building up. Um, there's, if, you're, if you're searching on the internet and you see Pompeii muscles and you see like this bright green or red um, in, in the muscle uh, microscopes, that's, that's the glycogen being stained. So like there's defi that's definitely happening. Um, the other thing that, that that's happening that is it maybe seems obvious when you think about it, but but is not talked about much, is that when the cells detect a limit in the available glucose, it triggers for one of those enzymes that's created that that's responsible for creating the glycogen in the first place. Or let me take a step back. When the cell detects a limitation in glucose, it thinks that it needs more glycogen it, that, that it ran out. So it, it causes the enzyme that is supposed to create the glycogen out of what we eat to what, what they call upregulate or create more, um, which, which can further exacerbate the issue. Um, so, think, so, so that's kind of the, 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 the biology background of, of why the muscles are involved or how they end up being involved. Um, but then there's more to it than, than just that, which you know, those are the, the, the effects of Pompeii, but there's more to it than just that. As we um, lose some muscle function over time um, or don't use the muscles, they get smaller. And this is true for everybody, no matter what. So if you think about, you know, when you were a kid or, or when you had kids that, um, you know, one of them broke their arm and it was, and, and their left arm was in a cast for, for, for six weeks. By the time the cast came off, that left arm was smaller than the right arm. And that's, that's, that's this mus muscle atrophying. Um, if you don't use it, 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 it will uh, break down over time. Um, and that's independent of Pompeii, but, but definitely makes it worse for us because, you know, we saw on the earlier slide, we have some of our muscle tissue that's, um, affected by the Pompeii, but some of it that is, that is not, but if we're not using that tissue, that will, that will get smaller over time. Um, and then the, the other part of it that I think is, is underappreciated is, uh, that physical function and everything really that happens within our body, um, is controlled by the brain. So it, it, it maps neurons uh, and, and a firing sequence to an action. So, um, and, and it's constantly reviewing and reallocating space. This is that concept called neuro, that we might've heard of, heard of called neuroplasticity. So um, the amount of brain real estate uh, is proportional to how much and how often you do something. So, you know, we can see, uh, you know, really clearly in, in, in the scientific world, uh, you know, in research, people that do a repetitive motion uh, over time, the part of the brain that, that lights up in, in an image uh, gets bigger the more that they repeat that, that action. Um, alternatively, somebody who does not do a single action at all, different parts of the brain light up because it's kind of like trying to guess at how to do it. Um, so we've heard this, this idea that practice makes, makes perfect as we, as we were growing up or playing sports or instruments or, or whatever. Um, and that, that all actually was based in, in real science, um, that the more you do something, the more brain that you allocate to it. Um, and it's also the opposite is also true, where the less uh, that you do something, the less brain that you allocate to it, and the more and then the harder it becomes. So when you put all three of those kinds of things together, um, being active in Pompeii is really, really important, because uh, you know, you're going to lose what you don't what you don't use. Um, I, put, I put in their flute example, like I don't know how to play the flute at all. So I would be really bad at it because I've never <laughs> practiced. Um, so I think that that kind of gives us a, a baseline understanding so we can jump into nutrition now. Um, and I'll have, I, I think just one more slide here uh, to be super nerdy and then hand it back to Vanessa for some real world experience on stuff. So digging into, uh, we'll talk about the exercise in, in a little bit uh, again, but um, digging into the nutrition part first, um, the idea relative to Pompeii uh, is to affect the metabolism within the cell um, by feeding it some different things. So we know that uh, you know, our bodies are really chemical processing plants. Um, they, we, we, put, we put food in, we put different things in and, and, it, and it breaks them down and, and uses them and sends out the stuff that it doesn't need at the backside. Um, so the, the better that we eat, the, 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 you know, or what we eat seems like it should matter for what we're, what we're producing. So the idea here is you can slow down the glycogen buildup by managing what, what you put into our body, what we put into our body, i.e. reducing the amount of sugar or carbs or those kinds of things that, that end up becoming uh, 
you know, that type of, uh, of energy, glucose uh, as energy. Um, and then there, there's another theory that is um, that you could potentially change the energy source for yourselves. Um, i.e., you know, we've heard of keto diet and those kinds of things, which um, really tries to focus on transitioning the energy source of your body from, uh, from, from carbohydrate or glucose sources into fat sources. Um, but for us, uh, and there's a lot of like debate on what the right thing for Pompeii is. Um, for, for Vanessa and I, and we talk pretty regularly cause, just because we get along really well, but our take on it is um, that what we put into our bodies is important for every other health and growth and long-term uh, you know, objective that we have. So it's a no brainer to try to try to eat well uh, overall um, for, for our long-term brain health, body health, everything. Um, what the specific and exact details of what that means for Pompeii are on how to optimize Pompeii versus the effects that a certain diet would have on the rest of our body um, is, is an ongoing discussion, but we can already kind of say like limiting sugar is, 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 is really good for our long-term brain and also probably good for our Pompeii. So we kind of take that approach of, of um, trying to eat well. Uh, and, and for us, it's slightly different versions, but, but maybe Vanessa, you can jump into some, uh, some details on that. Okay, um, there we go, some details. A nutrition high in protein is what's recommended as protein can be an alternative source of energy. It decreases muscle mass protein breakdown and helps to maintain muscle mass. I need to reset that. It decreases muscle breakdown, muscle protein breakdown, and helps to maintain muscle mass. So limit carbs to reduce the buildup of glycogen in the muscles. Try to avoid sugar and simple carbs, which I think Ryan just said. Um, protein from fish, eggs, and dairy products are rich in an amino acid called alanine. Alanine is important in the metabolism of glucose or the ability of the body to break down glucose into energy. Some have found that eating smaller, more frequent meals during the day gives more energy and less GI issues. Also suggested is a little protein at each meal. And some recommended um, recommendations from Duke University is 25 to 30% of daily intake of protein, 30 to 35% of daily intake in good fats, and 35 to 40% of daily intake in complex carbs. Some examples of high protein foods would be skinless, skinless poultry, lean meats, Canadian bacon, egg whites, fish as in cod, flounder, tuna, and salmon, uh, low fat dairy products, nuts and nut butters, and protein water. Some quick protein snacks to have on hand would be Sargento snack bites, any hard cheese, hummus, which is chickpeas, and beef jerky or hard boiled eggs, turkey sausage sticks, uh, Greek yogurt, protein bars like Quest or RX bars, protein shakes like Premier, Boost, or Ensure. When choosing protein shakes or bars, opt for those made from animal, soy, nuts, and whey protein. Also those which are low in carb content, which is sugar. And exercise, my exercise experience. During those years, I had the incorrect diagnosis. I felt my progression more than ever and I needed to make a change. Since it was my physical capability that was declining, I started there and I felt a little better. So I did more and I felt still better. Over a period of years, I worked up to my daily routine with cardio, stretching, gait and balance, and even some strength and respiratory training. I do this between the gym, a home routine, along with yoga and Pilates work. As a result, I've gained the confidence to leave the wheelchair and the cane behind. My balance is significantly improved and I feel stronger too. I have more stability and stamina as I move throughout my day. Is this you, Ryan, or is this mine? Yeah, I can give it a crack. Okay, I think it's yours. So yeah, so, um, uh, you know, and, and Vanessa's obviously, she's, she's had sort of remarkable um, results with, with her, with her routine. Um, but the, the, the things that she shared about her experience, uh, are pretty common. So like, for example, we were both told around the time of our diagnosis or leading up to it, um, that we should limit physical activity and not exercise. Um, because, uh, the thought th behind that was that it might be harmful for already damaged muscle tissue. Um, it's worth noting that this was relatively recent. 
Um, and so uh, a parallel reflection on that is that, you know, the majority of the literature that you're reading about the disease is based on patients who likely received this same advice, received and followed this same advice at, at some point. Um, and, and it, you know, we know now that it's clearly the wrong advice and it is bad information, but um, you know, it most likely comes from a time where we had a misunderstanding of Pompeii as a muscular dystrophy or a neuromuscular disease, or really misunderstanding of how it affected the muscle at all. So um, during that time, we both felt like we got worse faster than we ever had uh, uh, when we were following that advice. And we decided that, you know, going out sort of on the sideline wasn't going to be, be the way that either of us would lose our mobility. And we started, started, you know, slowly working towards something and slowly starting to feel better and then, and then increasing our training um, to, to an amount that, that worked for us. Um, so the, the there is a change happening around this thinking, around this, uh, this limit physical activity, um, uh, thinking amongst research and, and, and the researching community and, and experts. Um, and some quotes from, from more recent literature um, are here below. Um, one no thing to note is that even though that this is changing uh, for, for some, it takes a long time for this knowledge to actually reach every research doctor, researcher, doctor, and patient. So your local doctor may still be giving the, the advice up, front, up, up top. Um, and, and that's not because they're a bad doctor or a bad person. It's just the, 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 the specialty required to, to stay up to date on, on everything. It's, it's really quite a lot of effort. Um, so some of the, so, and we have some, some citations for where these quotes came from at the bottom there. Uh, don't worry about reading them or writing them down. Uh, we also have them at the end and we'll, we'll, we'll send this to folks who want it. Um, but, uh, you know, some of the, the, the selected quotes are exercise training appears to be safe, effective, and an inexpensive intervention uh, to improve functional metrics of importance to the health of Pompeii patients. Um, a combination of aerobic strength and core stability exercises is feasible, safe, and beneficial to adults with Pompeii disease. Um, and then muscles affected by Pompeii are indeed trainable. Um, you know, this one nods to adults and, and you know, in the, in the intros, uh, we talked about our experience. We're, we're sharing this experience as to adults. Um, for, for parents uh, or uh, of children uh, diagnosed by newborn screening and kind of wondering what the future is, we kind of look at our, look back on our experiences of, of, of playing and, and doing all these things um, that, uh, sort of allowed us to, to build functionality, build muscle as being really helpful. And probably part of the reason why it took so long to diagnose us, it, it's because we were, um, yeah, we were, we were pretty active. Both, I think both of us were very active as, as kids. Um, so uh, scrolling one more, um, the, the, the big takeaway there is that being active is really important for managing Pompeii. And now this is more than just opinion amongst a few patients, um, which by the way, our opinion is an expert opinion, but it's also being recognized uh, as, as truth, as true coming out of the researching and, uh, and, and uh, medical professional communities. I think this one's mine. Yep. Right. Exercise is great for the body, soul, and brain. Enzyme replacement therapy and eventually gene replacement therapy are important pieces. They set the stage for a normally functioning metabolic process, but they cannot do the work to improve overall function alone. Exercise is important as additional therapy to consider. Working on fitness and strength to maintain your health are important parts of achieving your lifestyle and independence goals at any stage of life. Progression and loss of function can be a slippery slope. So keep active and keep moving. Exercise recommendations. Pompeii can cause selective muscle weakness leading to coordination problems, weak core stability, pain and posture problems, and scoliosis. Appropriate exercise can help. Improve capability with daily activities like walking, running, climbing stairs, getting out of chairs, raising arms, posture, breathing. is all possible with training that includes aerobic endurance, muscle strength training, stretching, and generally exercising targeted daily activities. In other words, that means the things that we do on a daily basis, the walking, the running, the climbing stairs. 
These can be done at home or with support of physical therapy and massage therapy. The recommendations for Pompeii disease are cardio, 30 minutes a day, five to seven times a week, flexibility, stretching, and core, daily, five to seven times a week, balancing gait, daily, five to seven times a week, and resistance training and strengthening, three to four times a week. How do I begin? Is this my slide or yours? You want go, to take go, this? Go ahead. Okay. Go for it. I, I, I guess I'll say one, one thing along there is that, um, you know, for the general population, there's a reason that, like, you know, there's more gym memberships uh, in January uh, across the board than than anything else. Like, right, that's everybody's New Year's resolution is I'm going to be more active. I'm going to get healthier. I'm going to get fit. Um, the way that I, I think that both of us kind of think of it with relative to Pompeii is we probably have to work a, a bit harder uh, to get to get lower and fewer gains at this point in our progression. Um, but it, but it's all the more worth it uh, because, we, you know, to us, our, our independence is really important to us. And we want to, you know, stay as, at, a, at as high a level as possible for as long as possible. So, um, yeah, it, it's normal to feel like overwhelmed with how do I begin or how do I do this because it seems like a lot um, it's even more normal for that to feel that way if you've already if it's harder for you because of or harder for all of us because of our um, you know whatever progression that we've had um, but it, but it's super important so here's some some cool steps that uh, to, to help just take that first step okay um, your doctor can refer you to a physical therapist and this is Ryan's quote think insurance sponsored personal trainer which is a nice quote. <laughs> It's important to find a physical therapist that's willing to learn and can help adapt a routine to your abilities and goals. We both had physical therapists that we didn't mesh with or didn't feel like we were getting anything from. Think of it as finding the right therapist is like an interview process. Some Pompeii folks find that weekly visits to their therapist helps keep them focused and achieve their goals, while others visit every few months to tweak their routine or get help and advice. There are some physical therapists that also specialize in gait and balance. Some balance exercises can also be completed while seated, as well as strength training and cardio while seated. Some areas to focus on, core stabilizing flexibility and strengthening of abdominal and lumbar region, exercises that coordinate the movement of arms, legs, and spine are very important, and strengthening hip flexors, hip abductors, and the extension exercises will help with walking performance. Pompeii is a spectrum with everyone being affected somewhat differently. Find what works best for you. Um, exercise during ERT. One theory that hasn't been proven yet is fasting and exercising while infusing is a good idea. Based on the idea that eating causes a lot of circula circulating blood to direct towards the stomach and gut, to support digestion. The same blood that we put in this expensive juice, which leaves less of this enzyme rich blood to circulate and drop off enzyme to other parts of the body, the muscles. If we're actively using our muscles for strengthening or exercising while infusing, then the circulating blood is drawn to those organs or muscles. In combination, the idea is pref to preferentially direct as much of the enzyme rich blood from the infusion in our veins and bloodstream to be available to muscles rather than elsewhere. Do you want to comment on that one, Ryan? Yeah, so uh, there's there's long been some discussion around this. There has never been, um, or, or th there were not studies uh, that, that proved this to be a, a true or false uh, idea. You know, theoretically it makes sense, but in practice, you know, maybe it doesn't. Um, some other kind of um, numbers around the ERT concept um, you know, when we're doing ERT with the currently available product, uh, there's like something like one or 2% of it that's actually making it into your, uh, that, that's actually making it into your muscle. Um, the rest of it circulates into your bloodstream until it's eventually filtered out, um, you know, by your kidneys and, and, and you, you have really expensive piss after that. Um, and it's only really circulating in your bloodstream for, uh, a, about 24 hours after your infusion, maybe maybe a day and a half. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's some folks that I know that, that uh, really subscribe to this, this concept in a hardcore way. Um, it's, it's hard to say whether that 
is making a big difference for, for them or not. Um, but we, we thought it was you know worthwhile to share this with everybody um, to, again, expand on this idea that uh, you know there's a lot of flexibility that you can do depending on you know where you where you draw the line of what's important for you and and trade-offs and in, in, in your lifestyle all right and next one is adapt your routine to your goals we already said this but everyone experiences life and also pompeii differently it's important to figure out what works for your unique situation talking about it with others in the community can help and here's some examples some find that Pilates and yoga are excellent sources of exercise for Pompeii. They combine stretching, balancing, flexibility, strengthening, as well as breath work and meditation. Others use the resistance of pool of a pool, walking laps or swimming, various forms of a stationary bike, whether it's upright, recumbent, or an arm bike. Weights are resistance machines for others, reducing weight and building up reps to reduce the risk of injury. Resistance bands or loops are common tools and easy to travel with, as well as adaptable to lots of different movements, even while watching TV or working. One patient that's extremely active works out with bands while traveling, gym classes when home, surfs, dives, swims, runs, and rides bikes. Still another has physical therapy with blood flow restriction training two times a week and walks or uses an elliptical arc trainer of other few times a week. Another walks on the treadmill daily. Some quotes from our community about exercise. It's a lot of work to maintain, but it's important to me to maintain a somewhat normal lifestyle. You get a feel for what your body can handle or not. Doing something is better than nothing. Just smile and keep those Pompeii muscles moving. I basically try not to let my weakness stop me from doing anything. The more I exercise, the better I feel about myself and it raises my self-esteem. And staying active, active makes me feel like I'm more in control of this disease than it's in control of me. I think that might be the end of our presentation. Ryan, would you like to add anything here at the end? I think you did a great job, Vanessa. I think you did uh, as well. Yeah, so I think, yeah, we're, we're, our information's here, uh, both of us, um, are really happy to, to make time to, to, if you wanna talk, you know, kind of one-on-one -on -one about your scenario or, or find out some more about what we do specifically, uh, but also we can just go for any questions now. Uh, and then on the reference list, there's just uh, some relatively recent um, uh, literature uh, that, and all the ones listed here are, are free to access um, about uh, exercise or diet in, in Pompeii disease. So in case you want to read some more sort of structured study stuff. Yeah, the first one's actually my favorite, but I guess I shouldn't choose favorites, right? Well, you're, you're, you're allowed to. She, she, this is uh, by, by a woman in, uh, in, in the Netherlands who uh, works at Erasmus and they're probably globally the, the, the center of excellence in Pompeii. Um, and it's an it's a exhausting,ly long read. read. It's, <laughs> a, it's a hundred and something pages. 196. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of, some of some of that is uh is is uh pictures and and uh and references and all that kind of thing. But it's really thorough and it's and it's pretty recent. Um yeah, it's so it's it's her, it's her PhD thesis on 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 specifically this topic. So it's really it's really nice. It'll also have links and references to uh much of the other literature that that exists. Yeah, 